Last series, <clears throat> Knowing God's Will. In fact, if you wasn't in, and if you missed the last three weeks or you missed one of those messages, I encourage you to go and check out those three messages. Pastor Aaron, he made a statement last week that really set up this week. And so I, wanna, I want to say what Pastor Aaron said last week that I think is just so important. He said, seek God from a restful place, not an anxious place. How many of y'all remember him saying that? We seek God from a restful place, not an anxious place. You see, our culture is so full of fear and anxiety and running and running and running. We, we, we can't really seek God until we are in a spot that we can hear him. And we never stop. And so today's message is so, it, it, it just kind of really hinged on what he had to say last week. And I, I want to encourage you, if you wasn't here, please uh, go back and, and listen to that message. But the Western way, our culture, the way that we're programmed and designed in the United States of America, we, we are programmed to do more, to work harder. In fact, when I was a kid, and I've heard coaches say it to my sons uh, playing, playing sports, in fact, they said it to my daughter who was on the dance team, they said, you got to put in the work. How many of y'all heard coaches say that? You've heard that said, maybe you said that. You've got to put in the work. It's all about the grind. If you work harder, you'll get noticed. If you get noticed, you'll get a raise. If you get noticed, you'll get a promotion. If you work harder, you've got to put in the work. Because we are in the United States of America. We pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We forget that God is the source of it all. We forget that he is the one that put air in your lungs this morning, Doug, so you could put your feet on the ground, so you could get in the car that you own. He gave you the ability to go to work so you you could pay for that car, that hunk of metal out in the driveway. He gave you the ability to go to work and that you could, could, could buy that thing so you could drive that hunk of metal to this place. He is the one. He's the source of it all. And Chrissy, I just saw you here. God bless you. You had a miracle happen this week. Praise God. Y'all need to go talk to her. You need to tell that miracle. Sorry, I just chased a rabbit right there. I just saw Chrissy on the front row. Let me tell you something. When God does something big for you, you land up on the front row. You... Good grief. We're all about progress. We're all about achievement. We're all about doing stuff. In fact, our social media, you know how I know because I see your social media and it's all about you doing more and more and more and you got to prove that you are doing more and more and more and you never, you never stop. You're busy, you're busy, you're busy and you're achieving and you're doing and you're doing. It's exhausting just to see it. This is what I'm going to talk to you about today. We got to be busy or we got to be productive if not... Something's wrong with you in our culture. But God is saying that we need to learn how to trust Him, that He is the source of it all, that He's the one that gives us the strength to be able to do what we do, that He is the sustainer of life. Amen? Do you, you, are you with me so far? Now listen, if you're, if you're on the serve team and you're at the doors, don't let people out until they hear me out. No, you, you can let them out, but make sure they're not mad. I want you to approach this, this message today with some new lenses in your eyes. Are you able to see something new today? Just hear me out. Before you turn this off, before you disagree with me, just, just give me some latitude here because I believe that I've got a message that I have needed to hear. God has a plan to keep you refreshed. He has a plan to keep you rested. He has a plan to keep your mind clear. He has a plan that you will rest, and it's called the Sabbath. Now, Pastor, that's Old Testament now. Yeah, it is, but I'm going to give you some. Today's going to be a Bible study. I'm not going to preach today. I'm going to teach, and we're going to have a Bible study. Y'all, you, you brought your Bibles today, and I want you to get those things out because here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I, at some point, I'm going to come by where you're at in the Bible. Okay, but well, I'm going to give you some Old Testament scriptures, then I'm going to give you some New Testament scriptures. All right? Just hear me out. Point number one, because I know you're note takers. Point number one, and, and, and listen, I want you to take some notes because you're going to miss this. If you don't catch it, I want you to be able to go back and get this. Point number one is the Sabbath was established by God. It was established by God. What is the Sabbath? I'm glad you asked. Here's your, here's your definition for the Sabbath. It means to cease. It means to rest. It means to stop. It means to take a break. Now, there's two things that I'm going to say 
that, about, that God established the Sabbath. I'm going to show you one of those things. And the first thing I want you to write down after that God established the, the Sabbath is point A is that, that God took a rest. In verse 2 of the passage that we read, God took a rest. He, he, he rested after creation. He rested after he worked. He took a break. He stopped and he breathed in. In fact, when he was speaking, he was creating everything. He was speaking, and then he took a breath. I need to catch my breath. Sometimes we just need to catch our breath. God did not intend for us to work seven days a week. He did not intend for you to work constantly and consistently and never turning your mind off. And here's what I know, because it is true about me. We are constantly available. In fact, somebody's sending me a text right now. Some, y'all probably in here. Stop that. Stop that. We are constantly available. We are, we are constantly searching. Matt Lowe, stop that. We are constantly connected. We are constantly aware. We are constantly connected to everybody and everything. And we have to learn something new. And we think about something. Well, i got to look that up right now. But we're also worn out and we're exhausted and we don't know why I'm about to tell us it's because we never stop point A God took a rest point B my observation after I tell you that God took a rest point B is we never stop if you're taking notes now listen I'm old enough to remember life without a cell phone I know that's shocking Carrie and I, when we got a cell phone, we got one of those bag phones. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We shared 100 minutes a month. And because I'm the one that generally does all the talking, I got 95 and she only got five. And I would call her when it started getting close. i said, say, babe, listen, we got to slow down. Said, you got five. We got like five days left in the month and we've only got five minutes left. And she says, I haven't used it. That's a true story. It was cool, though, to drive down the road and be on one of those bag phones. You know what I'm saying? Hundred minutes a month. It might be a good idea to go back to hundred minutes a month. You know why? Have y'all ever heard this this word? This is my, maybe just my kind of word, but y'all, have you ever been frazzled? Y'all know what frazzled mean? Is that really a word? That's how we live most of the time. We live kind of frazzled. We live on the edge. In fact, many of us here today in this room, you're identifying with this message already. You know how I can tell? Because your, your, your heads are doing like this. We live 24-7 life. We never stop. In fact, many of us are in search of, of everlasting life. We're, we're in search of, of having a drink from the water, from the well that never, that never stops. We're in, we're in desperate need of that. But what happens is we never slow down long enough to catch the drink. We're like the marathon runners that are running by the drink station. And we get the thing and we throw some back and we keep. Y'all ever run a marathon? You know what I'm saying? Have you ever seen them do that? Yo, I tried that one time. I was running a 5K, and I, got, I, had, I was already walking. And, 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 but I saw that table up there, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run just a little bit so I can grab one of those on the go. Right? And I threw, so I was just, it was my first 5K, but I'm like, I'm going to try that. That's how we live, though. We live when we see Sunday's coming, and we're like, you're, if, if we could do a pull-through service, like a drive-through service at church, that, I'm telling you, it would be highly successful. You know why I know that? Because that's a, some of y'all would be coming, you'd be driving your jet skis and your boats right through that thing. You would be. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, Pastor Chad. What do you think? You know, I need to do that. But we're drowning 24 7, thirsting for living water. And we can't sit, we can't stop, we can't stop. The Sabbath, to cease, to stop, to take a break. This is an ancient idea, but I want you to understand something. It's not this intentional rest that I'm talking about, like intentional rest. We're missing it. This has been happening for 2,000 years, but only really recently, I would say within the last 150 years, the Western church, we've kind of, well, we haven't kind of, we've stopped even thinking about it. Historically, 
The Sabbath has been a part of our life, but it's been recently forgotten. I want to tell you a, a, a book that I read. In fact, I read it not once, not twice, not three times. And the thing that you can count on me to say every time I preach to you, every single time, is you need to be in the Word of God at least 15 minutes a day. Every day, you need to be in the Word of God. You can count on it. I'm going to say it sometime during this message. But I read another book, and I read it not once, not twice, but I read this thing three times because it had such a profound effect on me. It's a book called Subversive Sabbath, and it's The Surprising Power of Rest in a Nonstop World. It's, it's by A.J. Swoboda. I highly recommend this book. In fact, a lot of the content for this message came from this book. I want you to understand that the Scriptures, the scriptures tells us how to live. You can't obey a word you do not know. But I want you to understand, I didn't have any teaching on, on the Sabbath. I didn't have any, I don't ever remember, I grew up in this church from 10 years old. And I don't ever remember one message on the Sabbath. I didn't understand the principles. All I knew is my daddy taught me that we don't mow on Sundays. That's, that, I'm telling, that, but the preacher worked on Sunday, so I didn't understand. We don't mow on Sundays. Well, we went to restaurants and those people was working. If we hadn't gone to the restaurant, they wouldn't have to work. So I didn't understand it. I just, I just took it. How I many of y'all know when you grow up, you just, this is what your daddy tells you, and that's, what you, that's all you know. I got to searching the scriptures. This book told me two things that I just had to chew on, and I want to give this to you. Number one, two statements about the Western church that I learned from A.J. Swoboda. Number one is that we do, do stuff for God rather than being with God. We do stuff for God rather than being with God. That's important. I want you to listen to this, this second statement he made in his book. He, he said, he calls it Sabbath amnesia. In other words, we forgot. We forgot the Sabbath. Sabbath amnesia has led us to becoming the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. Now, that's a lot, and I want to say it again because I want you to write this down. And leave it up there just a little bit longer if you will, Hugh. The Sabbath amnesia has led us to becoming the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. And you realize that the very first thing that Adam saw God do was rest. It's the first thing. The Sabbath was established by God. That was point number one. Genesis 2-2, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested. Everybody say he rested. He rested from all his work. God modeled this before the Ten Commandments. He modeled it before Mount Sinai. He modeled it before the law, this principle, this rhythm of working and resting, working and resting. God modeled this system, and I believe that he established it, and it's important. The Sabbath rest was established by God. That's point number one. Point number two, and I couldn't condense this, so you'll just have to do a lot of writing right here. The Sabbath was first given, this is point two, the Sabbath was first given to Israel while in the wilderness, and in including, it included the gathering of manna, God's provision for his people. They're no longer being provided for by Egypt and Pharaoh. Now, now God says, I'm going to take care of you. I will give you everything you need, and they had enough. God was feeding them daily in the middle of the wilderness. They were gathering manna. They had enough. They were promised enough. And it was a miracle every day. They would go out and they had manna. What is it? They didn't know. They picked it up and it was, it was to eat. It was good. It nourished them. It, God was providing for them out in the middle of the desert. No stores, no Walmart, and no harps. Yeah. Now listen. I've been to the wilderness of Zen. I've been to Numbers 19. I've been to right where that is. And let me tell you something. There is nothing out there. You are completely dependent upon God in that moment. If you lived in the wilderness of Zen, that's where they were. If you lived there, you were completely dependent upon Him. Look at Exodus 16. I want to I read this passage and let you understand. So And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each person, each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath 
rest. A holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. In other words, cook today and lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until tomorrow, until t- tomorrow morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. It kept overnight. It kept until the next day. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a, sa- a seventh day, the Sabbath. There will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments? In other words, God said, On the sixth day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather twice as much. I want you to cook twice as much. And on the, on the Sabbath, I don't want you to gather. I don't want you to cook. I want you to rest. we got some Bible readers. Thank you for paying attention. Listen to me. He goes on to say in, in verse 29, See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Y'all, it's a gift. He's given us a gift of the Sabbath. Therefore, because of the gift, he says, I give you on the sixth day bread for two days. I'm going to take care of you for two more. For two days, another miracle occurred because the other days he couldn't store. But all of a sudden, he's he's given us enough on six days that we are sustained. God gives us all we need in six days. Going on, he says, let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So the people rested. Some of y'all, some of y'all already resting right now. (laughs) You're already, you're already, if you need a, if you need a rest right now, you just go ahead and take it. So the people rested. The people rested. I hope I get a nap this afternoon. That'd be good. Lay before the Lord. All right, uh, point number three. Point number three. God gives the commandments. He gives the fourth commandment. I'm going to read the fourth commandment. You say, Pastor, all this is Old Testament. I know, just hang on. Just That's all right. I didn't want you to leave. Hang on. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do most of your work. No, all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work. God invented this seven-day work week, and he did not intend for us to work every day 24-7. He wants us to rest one day. God says, I want you to stop. I want you to rest one day. And, and y'all, we, just a side note, we believe that we can, that we can um, honor all of the Ten Commandments, and we think that's a good, I don't think, Doug, I don't think we and you should go and, and shoot somebody today. I don't think it'd be a good idea for us to covet. I don't think it'd be a good idea for anybody to commit adultery. I don't think it'd be a good idea for anybody to lie today. All of these things, we all know that those are all things that we should not do. But for whatever reason, this Sabbath amnesia, we've forgotten the fourth one. And there's blessings that come with it. We'll talk about it in a minute. We believe that we can't violate any of those, except that we do not keep the commandment. I, I want you to understand, we don't keep the commandment to be saved. You keep the commandments to be blessed. There's blessings associated with that. There's blessings associated. So, uh, point number four, we are blessed and refreshed when we observe the Sabbath. Um, I'm skipping some in Exodus 31, but I want to go down to verse 16, Hugh, for the sake of time. Verse 16. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant Some translations say a perpetual covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. How long? Well, pastor, we're not Israelites. I know, but we're grafted in. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was... He rested and was... He was refreshed. Okay, so God was refreshed if God can be refreshed don't you think it'd be a good idea if we was refreshed is there anybody in here you're a candidate to be refreshed my I, my my hands or feet or everything I am telling you I'm a candidate to be refreshed and I hope you are too because when we run seven days a week and we never stop and, and when, here's what happens when you never stop What happens is your mind never stops. You never slow down. And what happens is we struggle. We struggle when we never stop. When was the last time you was refreshed? The last time you was restored? 
The last time you took a break or just a day off. When was the last time that you just rested? Y'all, we need to learn how to lay down. Joe, I think you ought to take a nap today. I hope when I said that we need to learn how to lay down, I hope a passage of scripture popped in your mind just like that. Because God gave me this as I was preparing for this message. He gave me this, and it was so good. Y'all, we love to quote the 23rd Psalm. Psalms. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's going to provide everything you need. That's your provision. He makes me. Oh, some of y'all getting it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. He guides me. You're in his will when he's leading you and guiding you. You find, I'll go back to what Pastor Aaron said. We, we, we find God in a restful place, not an anxious place. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. He guides me. He directs me beside the still waters. Then he, look at the progression. Then he restores my soul. When you look up, he makes me lie down. When you look up this phrase in the Hebrew, and you look it up in the Strong's, just write down uh, 7257. You can go back and look this up. I promise you it's what it says. It says, to cause to, to make to lie down, to make to rest, to sit. God's care for us is that he makes me lie down, he leads me, he restores me, and he guides me. That's his care for us. What's the result? Look at verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will... Look at the progression of this. This is the result. What he's saying is, he restores my soul... And that one is strong. It's 7725. It means to restore, to refresh, and I love this, to repair. If you find yourself broken and you find your, listen, the, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear. What he's saying is, look, learn to find him in the restful place, not the anxious place. And when you find him, he will restore you. He will refresh you. And when you walk through hell and when you walk through when everything else is breaking out in your life and you don't know what to do, I will fear no evil. What a beautiful place to be right in the middle of God's will, in his hand. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He's guiding us. He's leading us. He's restoring us. He's refreshing us. I'm just, I'm just going to say this. I, because of these, we're just... We're overstimulated. Where minds never stop. If you find yourself in, in the middle of the night, you wake up at 3 and then you reach over and grab your phone talking to somebody right now. Our children, my grandkids are just, their mind never stops and our minds never stop. We're so connected. This hyperactivity, we've become a slave to the thing that's supposed to be bringing us productivity. There's an app for everything and you'll get worn out if you're a slave to this thing. What I'm teaching you today, and I'm gonna get to the New Testament in just a second, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time, but I'm not there yet. The reason why I know that we need to learn how to stop and take a break and take a rest, the reason why I know this is a personal story of mine. A few years ago, about five, about five years ago, I was, I was getting 65 people together and I was gonna go to Peru in the Amazon in the jungle for about a month. And I was training, it takes like 12 to 14 trainings to get, in fact, some of y'all been with me on some of these trips. It takes about 12, 14 trainings to get everybody ready. And the logistics of this trip was crazy because I was staying the whole time and I was sending, sending a group home with leaders and more leaders was bringing me the next wave. So I had 24 the first trip. I had 20 something the next. I had 65 people totally in, in, in the course of a month with no break. Demonic activity all kinds of spiritual warfare, all kinds of wonderful things too, but nonstop. 
It never stopped. It was the next day, the next day, the next day. And when you got 20 kids with you and you're in the logistics and your mind, and I never, even when I was supposed to be laying down, I think Evan and Jordan was on that trip. Even when I was laying down, I was not resting because I was thinking about the logistics of the next day. And for weeks, for really three months before that, I was preparing them. I had had a stretch of time that I was exhausted. I got home from that trip, and it was awesome. I got home from that trip, but I was so behind here. I had people to visit. I had to go to the hospital. There was all kinds of things that just stacked up. I had things I had to get done. I found myself at Sparks Hospital. It was Baptist, it was Baptist now, Sparks Hospital back then. And I went, I saw two people in ICU, and I went and I saw another uh, on another hall. I came out, I got my truck, I started up, I was fixing to go to Mercy, and I was out of gas. Not my truck. My truck ran for three hours in that parking spot. And I cried uncontrollably. I was on the verge of a breakdown. This is so vivid. I remember I was talking to myself and answering myself, and I was crying, and I was saying, come on, Freeman, we got to go. We got to get to mercy. What's wrong with you? And I was answering, I don't know what's wrong. I mean, but three hours went by, and I don't remember a whole lot about it other than that. I lost track of three hours of my life. I was a fog, even a fog. And y'all, this can happen. And it happens when you don't take a break. In fact, there was consequences to the children of Israel if they didn't take a break, I would submit to you that I was very close to killing myself slowly because I had not taken a break. Some of us, that's where we find ourselves today. There's somebody in the room right now. You are on the verge of the brink of, a, of, 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 of something terrible in your life because you've never slowed down. You haven't stopped. You've been doing stuff for God and you haven't been with God beautiful thing is I called my friend Ben Story and you know what he, they're on vacation they took a break they're on vacation right now but I'll, I'll be forever indebted to Ben because I called Ben the next day and I said Ben this is what just happened to me and he said well brother you've got some compassion fatigue going on but you've got some other things going on too I'm going to give you some tools to help you but he says you need a break you need a rest if you don't stop, my friend, you will see what's going to happen. And he's a good counselor, and I, I encourage you, if you're, if you're finding yourself, and this is where you are, you can find a good, a good Christian counselor. You, they're, they're available for you. I'll tell you this, from that day to this, I still haven't done the Sabbath like I should because I didn't understand but I came on some teaching and it happened in Israel on a Sabbath and there was thousands of people camping on, the, on, on a Saturday. And I was like, what's going on? We're at Gideon Springs. What's going on? I've been here several times. There's always just our bus and maybe one more. There's always maybe 100 people here total. There's thousands of people camping. What's going on? And my bus driver said, you're such a Gentile. And I was like, what's going on? It's the Sabbath. What day is it? It's the Sabbath. Everybody had cooked enough the day before. The market was closed, and everybody took their kids camping. And I was listening to the children play. I was watching all of the beautiful things that I had been missing out on because I just refused to take a break. Now, New Testament. You thought I'd never get there. I've got two minutes. I told the first crowd, if you want to hear all of it, come to the second service. I'm going to preach till two. It's not true. Just calm down. John chapter 9, verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, speaking of Jesus, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. The religious leaders were questioning Jesus. They were, they were questioning his deity. They were saying that you are a lawbreaker. You healed. You healed on the Sabbath, and you can't do that. Again, the religious leaders, the Pharisees in Mark 2, they're questioning Jesus. Uh, Mark 2, uh, verse 23, one Sabbath, Jesus 
was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of grain. So they would pick it and they would do like this and they would just get the little kernels. They were just a little hungry. They were just, but this right here in Jewish law is working. You can't, you can't do, you can't pick. I want to tell you something. Jesus responds to them. He says, have you never read what David, a thousand years earlier, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? And in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some of his, some of, some to his companions. Jesus was responding to their challenge and he responds in verse 27. He says, then he, meaning Jesus, said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I want you to listen to this. The Sabbath is not to be worshipped. The Sabbath is not God. The Sabbath is not the Lord. The Sabbath is not to be bowed down to. Some people worship a day rather than worshiping the God of the Sabbath. Some people make the day the focus. I'm telling you, it, it, there's, here's, here's the deal. Even the people that complain and, and gripe and, 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 and argue and debate about which day, they're not doing what they should be doing. Probably they're not resting. Jesus' response says, I didn't make you to serve the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath to serve you. Now, you find it interesting in, in, in Judaism, you can, you can even, you can break the law. You can break the commandments if it's for the preservation of life. Because the value of the human need, the value of the individual. Donnie, your value, just your value is more important than the temple in, in Jewish law. You. The individual's need is more important than the temple in the Jewish law. In fact, they call it the pekuach nefesh. It's the value of the need of the human. The individual's greater than the temple. So God made the Sabbath so we could rest. It is for our benefit. Romans 14, 5 says it in this way. He says, in the same way, some think that one day is more holy than another day, while others think that every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. He's talking about the Jews right here. Those who eat any kind of food, they do so to honor the Lord. He's talking about Gentiles. He's saying, listen, you want to have some catfish today and you want to go have some pork? You can do that. That's okay. He says they do so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods, talking about the Jews because they're staying kosher, those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and they give thanks to God too. I didn't make you to serve the Sabbath, I made the Sabbath to serve you. Isn't that good? The Sabbath is a gift. It is a benefit. It's given to us by God. It's established by God. It's not a punishment. It is, it is a beautiful gift that He gives to us. The practice of Sabbath is for our rest. I'm out of time. I have several more New Testament passages I'd love to give you. I might do that on a podcast or something this week, but I think I've said enough to prove the point that, and there's people in the room today that you need a rest. You need to learn how to have an intentional break because your mind never stops. You're 24 seven, our, our society thinks that we have to work all the time or else we're lazy. And let me tell you something, that is a lie because what happens is you can be slowly if you never take a break, you can be slowly dying. Stress test, hypertension, all the things that happen when we never slow down. God has given us a pattern and a way to live, but we typically don't live this way. Some of you, you need a vacation. Some of y'all need to just take a, take a few days off work, y'all, and take your kids somewhere. Go do something fun. Life's too short not to have some fun. When I heard those kids singing in that park at, at, at Ian Herod that day, and, lit, and where, where Gideon and had the, the 300 men, some laps of, y'all know the story? When I heard the children that day, it was beautiful. I've been missing out. I'm gonna make a couple of statements as I wrap up. Number one, you can trust God. 
you can trust God. You can have enough in six days. He will provide for you. And some, you, you, some of you maybe haven't been good stewards and maybe you're having it. I'm not throwing condemnation at anybody right now. Please don't hear me say, I want you to hear my heart. I'm not putting any condemnation. I'm not putting anything on you. What I'm saying is if you, if you have to work seven days a week right now, please hear me say this. Please hear me say this. God can help you. You just pray and ask God to help you get to a spot where you don't have to. Where you're having to provide everything right now, I'm telling you, God wants to provide for you. He wants to help us to be good stewards to where we can get to that spot. You can trust God. You can take a day off. You can rest. You can take a break because God wants to see you restored. He wants to see you repaired. Lord knows I've been broken. And he can pick up the pieces of your heart. He can pick up the pieces of your life. And he can put it back together that true in summary God wants us to be worshipers every day the work on the cross has already been done Jesus has he's the perfect sacrifice in those days it was it was hard to bring a sacrifice you had to bring a lamb you had to bring a goat you had to bring something it was dirty it was hard and you had to you had to kill it to put it on the altar we don't have to do that anymore we can we can gather on Sundays we can come and celebrate and we can worship every day of our life it can become a lifestyle and this is what God wants us to do we should get up in the morning and say Lord thank you for the air you put in my lungs thank you for the the strength that you gave me that I can get up out of this bed, that I can go to work, that you can, that you can provide everything that, that I need. God, I know you can do that. And today, everything I do, I do it for you. It's for your glory. It's, a, it's, it's for a testimony of who you are in my life. Every day, we should be celebrating that way.